Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Okay, uh, Erev Tov, everybody. Um, thank you for, for coming tonight on the cold pre-storm night here in Toronto. Um, uh, this is our second year that we're doing Shurim on these uh, auspicious weeks of Shovavim. And uh, we have the, the honor mm-hmm. and zechut to have uh, Rav Moshe Rosenbaum, um, call him an expert in the field, but definitely a, a person that uh, it is worthwhile listening to on, on the subjects this evening. Um, on uh, common misconceptions in uh, Jewish family law. So, uh, it's, again, it's our great honor to have him, and I'm going to give him the chair here so he can address the kahal, and uh, enjoy. Bishut, Bishut, Rabbi Kadosh, Rabbi Pinto. Um, so l- let me just preface a drop. Well, first of all, thanks for coming out and giving me the opportunity. Um, let me preface a drop what this is all about. You know, Rabbi Kadosh mentioned that there is a, uh, we, this is the, your second year. Um, I found a fascinating Lavush. So there's, you know, the Rabbi Yosef Kairo, the, the Bet Yosef, he's the one who, you know, he's, he's the one who the uh, halacha that is, is the halacha that we follow. The Lavush was right after the Beis Yosef, and his halachas are the ones that are typically applied a lot more. He just, he paraphrases a lot the, the uh, Shulchan Aruch, the, the Beis Yosef, um, and he, he, sometimes he throws in something which is very important. Uh, he, he doesn't go in the Derech Avoida that much, but sometimes he'll throw something in. So I found something a few years ago which really, you know, Shavivim is, is, a, is a very holy time. It's, it's, a, it's, um, it's sometimes it's even beyond our reach. It's, uh, you know, there's uh, tikkunim that we do, that we do, that do, those who do the tikkunim, uh, they do it on a Thursday. And in general, these weeks are, are, are weeks, are very holy weeks. But I found something in the Lavush. If you mind me, I didn't bring along a copy, but I have a, a snapshot of the Lashon of the Lavush on my phone. And he says the reason why these weeks of Shovavim are special weeks, he brings two reasons. The first reason he says is because there's, there's a, a minhag to do, uh, to do Bahab after Sukkot and to do Bahab after Pesach. And because on a year of Shovavim Tat, on a, on a leap year, there's a, a farther stretch between the two, between Sukkot and Pesach, so it's, it, it only makes sense that we should that we should um, that we should you know do have some other days of tshuva in middle. Okay, so that's you know I don't know if uh, if any of us in this room fast. Uh, uh, exactly, that's what I said. I don't know if everyone, and if anyone even knows what bahab is. So basically, is brought down in Shulchan Aruch that there's a, a minhag and there's, it's actually actually the halacha um, to fast the after a shchodesh cheshvan. And after Shchodesh Iyar, the first Monday, Thursday, Monday, Bez, as in Monday, Hey, as in uh, Thursday, Bez, as in Monday, to fast. Now, in many circles, that's not, uh, it's not really uh, a commonly accepted thing. There are, there are special slichot, and you look in the uh, Nusach Svard Ashkenaz type of sedurim, they have uh, a slichot, a special slichot that they say for, for tikkun, for bahab. But what I mean to say is that that, to your point, not many people even know that bahab exists. So for us to build and compound on that, to, to say that we're not going to have a bahab, so we need to do it even better, that's a far stretch. So that's why I'm going to say the, the idea of bahab and the, the idea of a shevivim. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it over here inside. Od shemati tam who? The women, the pregnant women, in the year in leap years, the pregnant woman would miscarry. 
V'tiknu l'his'anus elu aches tanesim. And these weeks of Shavavim Tat, we, the Shavavim Tat is the extended Teruma Tetzave and Alipia, there's an extra two, two weeks. <coughs> they were metakin to fast these eight days. Keneged kol beiz veheishal chodesh ibor mishum hanoshim hamubare shaloy apilu. So that these that women who are pregnant shouldn't shouldn't um, shouldn't miscarry. Venerly shall if he's there tam according to this reason. Osi shapit fei mashes chilu lesanos beparsha shemois. It's very understandable why we begin parsha shemois because if you look in the Torah, mishum shaloyse parsha medaberes bepiri and berivin shal Yisrael. That's where the Torah says starts off with bnei Yisrael paru vayishrutu vayabum emod mod. The Jewish nation multiplied and fruit was was extremely fruitful. And then he goes on to to you know to another idea. So I don't know. It became a very a very uh, common practice to have awareness in these you know in these weeks, and I wonder if uh, a big source for this because I, I hadn't really found anything any other source other than. You know, it's, these are weeks for us to be metakin the inyanim of kedusha. So, you know, marital marital law, Jewish marital law, is, is you know, so sort of lends itself to this idea. So, why not? It's apropos to to put it in. But with this, I would say that there's something even more directly. There's there's Jewish. The idea of miscarriages is not limited to miscarriages. It's the idea of in inconsistency in the woman body. So the miscarriages don't just happen by itself. It comes from some sort of an inconsistency. And the inconsistency is really where the mistakes and the pitfalls in Jewish law, Jewish marital law, comes. And I, I, I happen to find that you know just the, the the group over here is you know is obviously a, a, an elder you know a drop uh, older than than uh, than the ones who are be busy with uh, staining issues and um, you know being able to to get to her but the these weeks typically are weeks where statistically in Jewish in Jewish families the idea of staining and being able to become Tahar, being able to get to the mikvah could have more challenges, and I'm sure the rabbis could, if they, if you look at your own at your own statistics internally, and see, you know, when there's a busier season uh, with the younger couples, it's these weeks seem to be. And and I, I until I found this lavush, I thought it was just maybe, you know, it's after uh, after the, the the you know secular holidays, so people start signing up to gyms again. You know, start uh, looking into new. There's advertisement for new diets, which these kind of things are typically causes, directly and indirectly, for there to be a, a, a big change in in the woman's body. Um, you know, whenever someone has an issue of becoming clean, we call clean as you know, to her to her husband. The the um, one of the first questions that we ask is, did she just change her diet, or did she? Did she uh, start a, a very severe kind of, um, we'll call it, uh, exercise? She started maybe something like a kickboxing or like a yoga, something which is very dramatic, very, <clears throat> very, um, very strenuous on the body. That these, in, you know, th- that's what I thought it was. But really, when I see from a not a mystical level, but from a from a, a deeper level, something beyond what the human eye can see. Um, there's there's a you know there, there's something special and and unique about these about this period of time. So I mean that that's just a, in terms of an introduction. Now the the common misconceptions in Jewish law, you know, Jewish family law is 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 very different in the younger, you know, in the younger years when someone is uh, newly married, you know, and when up until their forties and forty fives maybe, and then all of a sudden. Starts, you know, starts a whole new, whole new period where a period, no pun intended, but a whole new kufa in people's lives that maybe it's not, they seem it's not that relevant. So the first thing is, I had two weeks ago at around twelve o'clock on Matzah Shabbat, 
I had someone call me, someone who's older than me, um, and whatever you could imagine, I'm a younger, a younger rabbi, but then all of a sudden when uh, my friends who are a little bit older than me call me, a little bit, when, when they call me about uh, the shaylot they have for their, for their respective kehillahs, that's fine. But when they call me about their own personal life, it's a little bit uncomfortable. And he calls me up at around it was 5 to 12, 12 o'clock. But so Shabbos last week, and he tells me, um, uh, a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, this, is, this is involving my own personal life. So my wife stopped seeing for already 10 years. She hadn't seen anything at all. So she looks at the wash, you know, at, at the uh, toilet, and she found something there. And he said, like, I think I'm probably good, but I just want to make sure that, that I, I'm, not, I'm, not, you know, I'm not making a mistake. So I said, all laws of Jew, all Jewish law that pertain to a 19, 20, 25 year old pertain to a 70, 80, 90 year old. Nothing changes. The only difference is that the woman's body typically is on, you know, po- po- if the menopause is, is over. So at that point, it's not functioning. However, However, if someone were to have some sort of a fluke slash freak episode, it would make them just as not tahar as it may for someone who's younger. Nothing. There's no. There's no like. Um, I'm out of the system. I'm out of the program. I'm ready. Uh, I'm expired. I'm retired. It, these, Jewish law doesn't retire. It just the the one the one area which it does apply to is where they would, we call it a leniency, is someone who hadn't gotten what we call the period mm-hmm. uh, three times, then already they have a din of misuleket damim, that they're sort of not in the ballpark. So we, they have no reason to assume that they will see. But if they do see, then they're, they're, a regular, they're regular with the program. I mean, they have to... Five, uh, five days and seven days and, uh, and taking the chatzitzot, the mikvah, the whole, the whole nine yards still applies um, for someone who's uh, over the hill. So it doesn't, there's, there's, no, there's no like uh, retired uh, hilchas, uh, hilchas uh, nida. That's something which is, which is very relevant um, because I, I tell you a story that happened last month of Shabbos, but you know, if it just happened last month, Shabbos, it happened to me. To you know, it's come to my it's come to my um, to my uh, knowledge many times these kind of situations. And I'll give you another example where this where this could apply. Even if a woman's body is typically in in um, intact and it's working, it's functioning the way it should at a menopause post menopause uh, situation. But there are medical, there are medical examinations which every woman needs to do, and hopefully does them. <coughs> I'm sorry, but how do they know you? The Hindu Melech Elam, shall call me everybody. Amen. So, you know, needless to say, I, I always say whenever I whenever I speak in public, I always talk on a very elementary level. I'm sure you guys are. A lot more educated than I am, but I still this is just the way I do it. So we know that there are three areas in the woman's body, right? There's the uterus, which is up on t- which is up on top. There's a cervix, which is some sort of a canal, and then there's a vaginal area, which is the area which is most exposed to to uh, to us or to, to you know to one. Um, most medical examinations happen, obviously, in the outer area, the vaginal area. Therefore, when we're looking for blood, which is potentially a problem, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking, the problematic blood is blood, blood that's coming from the uterus, the rechem, the aim, the, you have all the areas which are much higher up. We're not looking for blood from the cervix or from the, or from the, um, or from the vaginal area, from oisay makam, referred to in the Gemara. However, the cervical area is this, you know, it's called a prezdar, a prezdar, it's called a hallway. It's no, you know, there's no hallway with some nice lights on the side. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, un, it's a, a pardon? It's a cube. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a flashy area, which is, it's very hard to, to define exactly. And therefore, since it's a, a hallway between the 
vaginal area and the uterus, so anything which is going on in that area, we have to assume that the same way it could be from the vaginal area, it could be from the upper area as well. And that, that's why there's a, a very strong reasoning to maybe have to have to, to be stringent a little bit if someone would find some sort of a bleeding from that area. Now, there's the rule of law that one could just know is typically if anyone ever has a medical procedure without any local anesthesia, without a local anesthesia, typically we assume that there was no that it didn't impact the opening of the uterus. Because in order to, there's such a strong muscle there to, con, to contract that muscle and to open it up, you know, manually, we'll call it, is, would be is excruciating pain. And the only way, if you remember the childbirth days, the, the only way that we could do that is from the Neflot Tabore, how, how Hashem does these, that makes the contractions beforehand to loosen it up, to open it up. But other than that, the, the, it's so tight, the, the, the cervix and, and the, the rechem is so tight, you can't go in. So when we say, en psicha tamakor belodam, every time you open up, the, every time we know that, there's, that someone impacted the uterus, therefore it would make them tame, the rule is it needs to be something that penetrated with a local anesthesia. If it, or general, but if it was with a local anesthesia, if it was not with a local anesthesia, and she didn't go out of her mind from pain, we could assume that she probably didn't impact it, the 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 doctor or the um, the practitioner probably didn't impact deep enough that it should be that it should be concerning. So typically, where's the, what do they do? You know, every woman goes through once a year a Pap smear test, and even if People didn't do it when when they do it. I, I, I make it as my mission to make sure that uh, I mention this by, by the shiur and by the classes and shavim because some people feel like I'm already over the hill. I don't have to do this kind of stuff. This is from the 20s to the 30s. A pap smear test is something which is a, an absolute obligation. And even if people have, um, they, you know, they, they're not that on top of their game. You know, they're, they're more into the children already at this age and they don't, they're not focused on, the, they're more reactive in, met, in, 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 uh, in their physical health. <clears throat> they, you know, deal with uh, an infection, chas v'shalom, or deal with uh, this or that. They don't, they're not proactive. Pap smear test is something which should be, like we call it, chok v'lo yavor. It should be something, to me, the considerum, once a year, a woman should do what I like to call the camp test. You know, when, you go, when, when we went to camp when we were younger, we always had to go for a physical examination, just to make sure from head to toe and everywhere in between is, is king. And by a woman's body, they're prone much more. And obviously, needless to say, as people get older, it's even more of a, more of a thing. And, it's, and you know, most of the time, it's, it's the guy's responsibility, like everything at home, to make sure that it really gets done. So it's our responsibility to make sure that they do this one year, this annual test, this annual checkup, and the pap smear test should be done, along with the testing of her breasts to make sure that there's no lumps and there's no anything. And obviously, we, you know, I'm, I'm sure they, they've learned this when they were younger, but they should make sure to learn to, when they go to the doctor to see if there's, there, there typically are some sort of a lump. To make sure at one point do I need to, um, be, do I need to be concerned going forward. So now, that pap smear test, basically what it is, is it's like a toothbrush. It's like a toothbrush with some bristles, you know, like a, like a pen, like a stick, with some bristles coming out. And with the way the test works is we smear, it goes one swab type of thing. It smears the walls of the uterus and may, taking off some cells and they process it. Basically what that doing is, it's scratching the walls of the uterus. Uh, of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Of the vaginal, of the vaginal walls. And that's going to cause bleeding. But again, since that's from the vaginal wall, that's not a problem. Now, you know, for those that it's relevant, it's, you know, it's probably typically a good idea, recommended to refrain from marital relations for a day or two afterwards because we, never, we always want wounds to heal. Next is when they, when they open up that area, if there's anything that they need to check out, they always put a speculum inside, right? The, an opposite of a clamp. They always they put the speculum. The speculum will never open up 
the cervix, like we said before, it's impossible. They go out of their mind from pain if they would. So the the speculum again just is just clamping on. It's just like opening up the, uh, one's mouth when they go to a dentist uh, for a dentist treatment. It's not that it's not impacting anything of major of major um, uh, major impact on the body. So that wouldn't have anything. Now they do sometimes have to impact when they go when they put in some sort of a catheter. Excuse me. Oh. When they insert some some sort of a catheter inside, so really one could argue that there's a psich samakar, it's going in, right? So I remember asking this question when I was a young a young lad. I it, it always bothered me when when the uh, I mean, it bothered me. I was, I was thinking about it when a woman goes into childbirth, and the doctor said it's open one centimeter, two centimeters. Mm-hmm. That means that it's open. So what does it mean? Ain psich samakar dam. She should be tummy. Doesn't the 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 natural kind of opening? That's not a problem. When an average woman, once she has two or three or four children, she her her rechem is always open a little bit. However, when we do something which is going to penetrate to open it, that's the problem. So if we put in uh, some sort of a catheter, which is the reason why someone would do some sort of a catheter is a little bit more invasive kind of testing. The test for polyps, right? They Sometimes, if there's anything that anything's going on, any irregularity in 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 that you know in in a woman's body, one of the things they're going to check for is polyps in that area, which is a very common kind of a kind of an issue, and they have to cut those out. So when they cut those out, so really cutting those out touches on a very sore sore point, no pun intended. The it, what's happening is they go in, they they do an ultrasound outside. And then they stick something inside, another type of a camera, and in, on that camera it also has a small scissor, a snipper. So in case they're going to have to, instead of going in twice, they, they and it's a very, it's, it's minuscule, it's, it's less than the shear, less than the, the amount that what we would consider opening up the walls of the rechem, typically. Um, you know, before such a kind of procedure happens, it's obvious so it's always best to run it by a rabbi who knows um, these kind of things or knows what, what you could ask the doctor to find out what he's doing or he or she are doing. Um, it's, it's, always a, it's always a recommended and suggested uh, thing. Um, they're laparoscopic. Right, they're, they're always laparoscopic. So it's very, they're, they're very, very small, very thin. Today, you know, the... the the mill, it goes down by millimeters every year. I, I remember I, was, I, I researched one of these instruments that was coming. They have it, it's called the French, the, the, the number is, but it's, it, it's called the French size. So the, um, I, I, was, I was looking into uh, someone who was going through an infertility treatment, and they were trying to insert something. And um, I, remember the, I remember doing my research, and around two years later, I was, and, and the, then it was a problem. You know, two years later, I, 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 uh, I ran it by another, another time, someone else had the, the same issue, same instrument, same, same process, and, I, and I, I ran it by a doctor who's, uh, who's very, learn, you know, very learned, very educated, and especially today, it's so easy to get the up-to-date information with Google, and not for us, but for the doctors, if, they, if they're smart and they know how to read these kind of things. Then um, you know that for them it's no big deal. And he reads and he tells me, no, nah, this is like two oh. two millimeters. It went down from being like 22, 24 millimeters to two millimeters, like to almost nothing. So and and with a with a snipper on top. So they you know depending obviously on what the procedure is done. What, what my point is, if the this because the laws of nida don't expire and don't retire, so it's always relevant for us to be on top of the game. No matter how old we are, no matter what's happening, we always have to ask a doctor. And really, who am I to tell older people about this? But when we go into doctors and we don't ask them what they're doing, we're being careless. We always have to ask them what they're doing, what, what they what they plan on doing, why they're doing it. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. If they ask questions, that means we care about our body. 
And if we care about our body, they're going to care about our body. If we come into them and say, listen, whatever, you know, you're a shliach, malach, Raphael, whatever you do, <laughs> it's, you know, I trust you, it's, it's fantastic. It's, then, then they say, oh, yeah, it's up to me. I could, I'm sure all of you have read, heard, seen enough horror stories from doctors that were careless and reckless in their behavior. The doctor, I don't know if any of you guys are doctors, so I, I don't mean to talk uh, negative about them, but the, we, we know Tov Shabirov and we know what the Gemara says about them. Right? But the idea is that we need to be on top of our game, and if we're top of, on top of our game, number one, we get med- better medical treatment, and number two, we also we know what to speak to a rabbi about and tell them, this is what they did, and because they did this, does it change my status? Am I, am I uh, pro, you know, am I in, in a good status or not? Um, just to my point that I said before about someone who does become tummy, um, whether, whether it, it, it's classified as a period, which is obviously not something that relevant for older guys, but, but even if it's something which is classified as a stain, um, a stain, in order for a stain to be a problem, there's, it needs to have three and a half components. It needs to be found on something white. It needs to be found on something which is macabotoma. It needs to be found the size, minimum size of a penny, more or less. So when something... Is, one you won't consider it at all? We don't consider it a stain. Not, a period, yes. A stain, not. Yeah, less than, less than a penny, we don't consider... We don't consider a, a stain. Again, I'm going to rephrase it. A stain. Yes. Now, if something was done when it, immediately following some sort of a medical treatment, it has much more of a severity because then it borders the chance of it being a hargasha. So, biblically, in order for something to be a problem, it needs to be a tipas dam kechadl, the size of a mustard seed, with a body sensation. Today, you know, the, the body sensations which are referred to in, in the poskim are trembling, are feeling somehow that the rechem opened up, or nakitsas meraglayim, some sort of when urinating, some sort of a very sharp prick, sting. It's not relevant today. For the most part, 99.9%, I would say 100%. But if the, you know, nothing in the Torah ever, ever expires. So you know, who are we to say that it doesn't? Not relevant. But 99% it doesn't. And those women who do get some sort of a body sensation, it's, they're mistaking it for some sort of a cramp. I always say, any guy who doesn't know if his wife is, is getting her period you know, is not a good husband. You see when she changes her moods and she starts getting acting up a little bit, Maybe even eating a little bit starts, you know, nibbling on chocolate all day. You know, everyone have everyone married long enough knows when when those things, you know, when those things kick in. That's really relevant for people who are getting periods. I think that we're, you know, for that for that discussion for tonight is not that relevant. <clears throat> uh, you can correct me afterwards if I'm wrong, but for the most, uh, that's that's not our, our our conversation tonight. But what is relevant is when there's direct access to the vaginal area, to the opening of the ad- vaginal area. For instance, the way the three the three examples that the Gemara refers to is immediately someone who found found a stain immediately following urinating, or immediately following marital relations, or if someone found something on a cloth that they check themselves, the idea that Sad HaShaveh, the common fact, the common denominator, is that he was tampering with the opening to the vaginal area. So then the Gemara calls it Dilma Ergisha Velav Adaita. Maybe she had a sensation, but she wasn't focused. She was preoccupied because she was tampering with that area anyways, so she didn't realize that there was a tremble or some sort of a prick or whatever that was going on over there. Now, Again, this doesn't, is not really that relevant for us. But where it could become relevant is, and this is a mistake that some people make, is there's two types of, many, but for the most part, there's two types of feminine protection. One of the types of feminine protection is a, put, a woman puts in a liner, you know, a pad, the liner or something into their, 
into their undergarments. And then there's another one called a tampon. A tampon really is a regular aid bedika. It's a, ready, it's a regular bedika cloth. And therefore, the mo- most minute d- drop of blood found on a tampon, or maybe drop of blood, becomes a very, a very serious problem. Because it has, it has Dilmer Gishavalava Daita. Maybe she felt a sensation. It's inside, right? It's, 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 it's in the vaginal area. As she's moving, walking around, whatever it is, or she put it in, we don't know when that small drop of blood came from. So chances are she's, she's an older, older girl, older woman, so it's probably something else. Okay, but now we have to start putting on our thinking cap and start, you know, the, 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 the Ramban says, Kol yocha Anything which we could possibly attribute a kesem is we could we could attribute it to. The reason for that is because we have a suffix durabanon lahakil, suffix daraita lachumra. Whenever we have a biblical suffix, we have we're unsure about something which is something which is mafurish in the Torah, then we say suffix lachumra. You always have to be more. You have to be stringent. I remember when I was learning when I was taking shimush. And, and learning, I, when I finally got, I went into a, a big Talmud Chacham in Eretz Yisrael. His name was Rav Shmuel Halevi Vozner. Rav Vozner, he was, he was from the senior, senior postkim in Eretz Yisrael. I think he was nifty, he was 94, 95. He was, he was an older, very old person. He was a big Talmud Chacham. B'nai Brak, you guys I'm sure heard of. He was one of the, he was appointed by the Chazon Ish to be the Rav of B'nai Brak of that area. He was, he was huge. And I, I had this chut of, of uh, taking shimush by him, and he and I asked him before when before I, I left. I said, "What do I need to know?" So he said, "One of the things you need to know is that you gotta dodge out the daraita, the the minat Torah, biblical issa. Once you a transgression of, of a biblical transgression, that's suffic. You're unsure. You have to go. That we have to, you have to take the hard line. In the drabanon, then you could always suffic this, suffic that. You could always." You know, throw throw different things on the uh, uh, on top of it. You know, maybe maybe it'll you could um, you could apply it. So suffik drabanon lekula, suffik drabanon lechumra. Reminds me when I was when I was learning actually at at a kolel in Eretz Yisrael. Every time you have a suffik, so let's say you forgot if you made a bracha shahako. Yeah. You took. You have a cup of so orange juice. Yeah. You're not sure. Suffolk. Yeah. A bracha is lekula. Suffolk lekala. A lekula. You have someone you forgot. If you don't know if you if you said berchat amazon. Yeah. So the first parak, the first bracha on berchat amazon is daraisa. Yeah. Or you're not sure if you said kriya shema. You you're one of these absent-minded professors. You don't remember if you daven, if you didn't daven. You forgot if you said kriya shema. You gotta say it again. Suffolk daraita. Lechumra. Lechumra. Safik drabanan lukula. But in a safik of drabanan lukula, you can't just throw whatever you want under the thing. So I'll use, I'll use the term that the Gemara says and then I'll explain it. Dilma azla beshuk shal tavachim lo amrinan. Azla beshuk shal tavachim. Dilma nitma, Dilma, maybe it went on him, amrinan. I'll explain to you what it means. In the olden times, they had a, a, slaughter, a slaughter market. Right, they would, everyone would bring their chickens and their cows and their well, who knows what, and they would slaughter them, and they would come to the shochet, and he would he would do what he needed to do. Today we don't, you know, for the average guy is not walking around in a, in a shochet area, right? But but that that's the way that was a very common practice, and and therefore there was there was exposure to other blood, foreign blood was a very common kind of a thing because it wasn't as clean as as where we are, you know, if we. If you go to Sobeys and you buy a package and it's not, you know, if you see a drop of blood in that diaper that they have on it, you're going to pass it up and take the next one, right? You, we want to have something which is perfectly, perfect stuff. But it's not the way it was. So, so Dilma Azla Beshuk Tabachim, I don't know if maybe I went in the marketplace, I found blood, but I don't know if I went in the marketplace, that you can't say. You can't just throw on now any, you know, any, any suffix that you want to have. But I went in the marketplace. I just don't know if I, there was a chicken spritching at me. 
then then I would then I would, that that you could say that you do say Safik Rabban Lakula. So when I was learning in in, in, in Israel, I had. Your accent, Rabbi, is confusing. Safik, what did you say now? Safik Rabban Lakula. Lahakel. 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 Safik Rabban Lakel. Lakula is Aramis. Aramis. Lahakel. I'm sorry. So no, no, it's all good. So, um, so I went in, in Israel. I don't know if you have if you ever seen before Yom Kippur, they have the meaning of kaparot. Yeah. They take some some people do it with money and some people take it with a chicken. Now we over here in Toronto they also have that minhag. Is up north they have it by Chabad Gate and they have it down south by the yeshiva. So I went over there in Yerushalayim. I went to one of these one of these places that they had the. Uh, that, that they that they did the kaparot and that the, the kaparot that they do over there, they they slaughter it on the spot. So I mean, you know it was, it was exciting. I took my kids. It's something that we we went for a couple of years ago. We went for, for we were living there. It was nice. So we we uh, I took my family and we were walking over there. You see everyone's you know chickens running mm-hmm. around and 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 uh, and they're chasing the chicken. You want to get make sure you bring your chicken. You get your kapara. You don't want. Uh, your friends have it out. You want to have your, you know, bad enough your own. You want to, you need to pick up your friends now, and and they and they go to the rabbi over there who who, who shechts the chicken, and um, and it was it was, a, it, was a, it was a beautiful experience. We had the opportunity to do to make the bracha of kisui hadam. After you kisui, you 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 cover the blood. You put the thing on. You put sand on top of it. The dust. It was it was a, it was a nice experience. The next that afternoon. That was by lunch. That afternoon, I come back to Kolel, and um, we were learning the laws of staining in in, in, in the Kolel with the, with the guys. And a guy, one of the guys, comes over to me and tells me, Rabbi, you, you have some blood here. So I, I was like, right away, I think I thought maybe I had some sort of a pimple or something that burst it. And I'm thinking, of, I went outside, went to the washroom, and I felt it. And I'm like, I'm cool. So the weirdest thing. And then it dawned on me. As I was being curious, probably, I went through a marketplace that they, that they spritz blood. Yeah. So, Avra you go into a market where you're exposed to blood, you could, you could rely on it. But you can't just say, you know what, I didn't do kaparot, I'm not sure if I did kaparot today, so maybe I went downtown to Chai Chicken or to Marva Chicken where they chug. You can't say that, right? It needs to be a rational kind of suffix. So bring it back home, bring it back to where, where, where we're going, is a leniency that we want to be lenient in any of these situations. We, we, staining has a leniency. Kol t'liot sha'ata yachol l'tlo tolomo. Ramban says, one of the Rishonim say, any t'liot, anything that you could attribute the finding of blood to, you could, you could attribute it to. It doesn't have to be that reasonable. But it needs to be reasonable. It doesn't have to be that reasonable, but it needs to be reasonable. It needs to have some sort of a substance. Now, that being said, we have, we have that's why, you know, if, if, if uh, someone do, go, does find some blood immediately following a, um, a medical examination or a medical procedure, so that's one of the strong factors that we're going to take into consideration. Avra b'shuksha tabachim. She went through, for the most part, right? There was exposure. There was there was pricking, puncturing. They were they, they were they were careless so, to a certain extent for those small scratching and bleeding that could cause from the vaginal wall. So that's why we're going to be able to. The rabbi will be able to use the what what I'm going to refer to as the term of avra b'shuksha tabachim. She went into the into the slaughter marketplace. We don't know if she actually scratched herself or not. Then we say it's a drabanan. But if we have a reason to, 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 if it was found immediately following, immediately. So she wiped herself with a sheet that was with the, you know, that paper that's on that thing or something like that. You know, that's on the, that's on the bed. She wiped herself immediately, immediately. I'm talking within 15 seconds, which typically they don't do, between 15 and 30 seconds. She wiped us up with that. Then we have a safek biblical. Safek biblical, then we have to go to Chumrah. Now, I always say, 
speak to the rabbi. Never jump to conclusions. Whenever we have a safek, if you're not sure, you know, listen, if you're not sure if you said, Amazon, you don't know if you have to call the rabbi or not. But if you're not sure if, if this is the repercussions of this, if someone, see, someone has seen uh, some blood and they're not sure what it is and the repercussions are going to be to be off limits for 12, 13 days and go through the whole shebang again and again, especially people who are not that young and not that used to it, it's, it's something which, um, which uh, should be ran by, by a rabbi. And, uh, you know, I, I always like to say this again and again, even though you guys are long, much older than me. Um, rabbis do this stuff. This is what, you know, sometimes people are uncomfortable. And it's important you could, tell, you could give this over to your children as well. This is what rabbis are involved in these kind of areas. This is, these are, these are I have, I, I was out of town today, and again, I apologize for my, my delay. I, I tried... I was on an early enough flight that I should have been here with a delay, but I guess Air Canada's, you know, threw on another delay afterwards. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late. I'm happy I made it something, but I was out of town for a day, and I know that there are people waiting for me at my house with with Shelo to show, and this is a very normal thing. People have to show their, whether it's clothing, whether it's a bedika, and it's normal. Rabbis are very used to seeing these kind of things, and it's not considered like, you know. Awkward, awkward situation. It's almost like. So we, I don't. My wife doesn't get involved. My wife leaves it for me. I should do. I should take the whole thing, and they give it to me. And it's almost lahavdil. It's almost like someone entrusts a doctor. He's not going to go to the the guy, doctor's wife to take care of it, right? You 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 go to the doctor, and the doctor. That's what he went to medical school. And he knows what he's doing best. There's no, it's a professional, we look at it from a professional lens, and this is the way it's done. There's no, there's no reason for awkwardness. And, and it, it, it always happens to be, it's you know, a little bit you know, off script kind of a topic, but like, it always bothered me, that whole Rabbanit kind of a, a concept, because, I mean, if I'm, you know, if I'm being checked out, I, I, not, not often, I mean, my preference is to go to a male doctor, but you know, if 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 I'm in the Shalom in the ER and there's a, a woman's doctor there, I'm not going to say I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm going to wait for another three hours until the 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 male doctor comes in, right? And and, and vice versa, you know, if I'm, if my daughter or my, my wife or whatever, you know, other women are, are in a, are in a hospital and a doctor, they're not going to say, okay, you know, I, I don't want to be seen by by a male. I, I'm I feel more comfortable now. If, Sometimes, if you're going to book a specialist or whatever, and you've got the time, so you get a female doctor. You could have a female doctor. How many female gynecologists do you know? I know one. You know one. How many? How many <laughs> male? How many ga- male gynecologists do you know? Lots of. Them. Lots of them. So there you go. You just answered your own question, yeah. right? Uh, they all these guys. You can't get into any of these any of these uh, gynecologists, obstetricians. You can't get into any of the practices, you need to wait for who knows how many months with referrals to be able to get in. For some reason they're not, people are not uncomfortable. Why? They went to medical school, they're, it's a professional business, they're doing what they need to do, they disconnect, they, 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 they have some sort of a Chinese wall, whether they're in the community, not in the community, I don't know, it doesn't make, to me it doesn't seem like it makes much of a difference. I have some of my family and my wife's closest friends come to me and discuss their personal life, and I know that they're expecting from day 40, uh, day 45 of their of their you know after they went to the mikvah, and my wife will tell me you know in the eighth month or seventh month you know my closest friend she just uh, she just told me that she's pregnant so I'll be so excited and I won't I won't lead her on to know to tell her yeah I I knew this from you know from the first month, but because the same way. A lahavdil, a doctor, won't share his information, and if he does, he should be pre- shot. should be shot <laughs> and, and in a different area. He, it's 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 you know. But this is all new to me. What you're saying. hundred percent. I, I want and, I, and I, every. I mean, it's all new to me. I'm 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 going off script because this is something that sometimes I feel that. In, in the days that I had black hair, you went to a female guy that told me this. At the clock, you took it to the rabbi. But 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 I'm asking but I'm asking you a question. Do I make sense? What? Do I make sense? 
But I'm saying, does it make sense? No, because I'm not used to it. Oh, no. I didn't, I didn't say what you're used to. I'm saying, does I it make sense? Sorry, if I if I go if I go to Iran and I see a man who has no food, I say, what are you doing? Is that But let's have it out because we, we don't have such a big audience. No, do, do, I, do I make sense? He's saying he's the expert. If you, want to, if you have a girl, you're your private doctor. You're going to go to your private doctor. If you trust in your doctor, he's the, he's the expert. He's going to give you the information. You're not going to go to the doctor. He went out of our way to find a female gynecologist. You, you, I, I'm sorry if you asked you. I had a gynecologist. He's a good friend of mine with the Iraqis. But but I'm but I'm I'm asking, I'm asking, I most of my friends, uh, I'm, all my children were delivered by a male doctor, because he was a professional. He was the best that we had was a professional. Anyone in this room looks for a, a female gynecology. There are those that do it for that. There's a certain sensitivity. It's new, but the average guy today, look in look in you know look in the in in uh, Sunny Brook. The list of the list of doctors of gynecologists, I think it's hands down. I think everyone's going to know that there are much, much, much more male gynecologists than female. I think that's a pretty. I think that's a fact, right? Mogal lo mogal, the the musad, right? That makes sense. So why is this any different? What? Why is this area? And and I'm and I'm bringing this up because precisely because this is. Contrary it's to an ongoing feeling. Yeah, but but it, it's contrary to, to popular popular understanding and approach. But if you think into it, I think I'm saying something not that I'm not saying you're accustomed to this, but I'm saying something which I think makes a lot of sense. And I'll tell you I'll tell you even more so. I could show you my list, I won't, but I could show you my phone. I have dozens of women that call me anonymously because they're uncomfortable. And I respect them 100%. Okay, that, uh, I'm willing to go that far. So, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you where, the, where, 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 this, where this comes extremely unhelpful. So I had two people calling me. They deposited something in my mailbox anonymously. Yeah. Happens to be that they had the same last name, but they, they both deposited them anonymously. One was a problem, one wasn't a problem. Oh, so... What do I do now? Now, who shot themselves in the leg? The people who are anonymous. That's one area. And this just happened to me, I think it was like three, four weeks ago. I was going out of my mind. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, it was only my, and when they showed it to me at night, it was a problem. By the time I got to the morning, they were both good. But I, I'm, I was sweating. I was, I, was, I was so upset. I was so upset that I let these people get their way to be uncomfortable with me. And I respect their privacy. It's New York. It's New York. We'll put it aside. Uh, when they go to beaches, they, they, have, they have no problem with it. It's New York. And when they go do this, I don't mean it. You know, in, in a, the, when, they go to, when they do everything else, then they're fine. And when it comes to the rabbi, oh, well, then we need to have the kavod. This is what David HaMelech said, Yadav miluchlachot letayr isha labayla. My hands are dirty. To be able to be metaher, a woman to her husband. He's busy opening and checking. And to, that's, what, that's what Rabbi's doing. This is, this is what Rabbi's doing since David Amelech's days. Maybe even earlier. But in closing, I, had, I have another, back to my, my point. On my phone, I have a list of dozens of women who are anonymous. So I have Ilana Anonymous, Alana Too Anonymous, Dorit Anonymous, I have all kind of people that by mistake they'll say, uh, hi Rabbi, this is Dalit, this is the, but they still won't tell me who or what they are and I totally respect them and they could, if they'd like, they could continue doing that. I right away, I save their number in my phone as Dorit Anonymous, Dalit Anonymous, so that they could be calling me sometimes three or four times a week. Now, I'm not, I don't keep track of everyone's Personal life. You have Dorit one, Dorit two, Dorit yeah, three. exactly. So, but, but I, I keep it under anonymous for me to be able to, it, it's, yeah. you know, have other Dorits that I that are not anonymous. <laughs> so, so, so I, my anonymous that's where that's it just shows up in my phone. It's it's just much easier for me to, uh, to, to to keep track like that.
So, because of that, I'm able to at least, well, some, many of these people WhatsApp me or text me, so I'm able to look at the thread of the same anonymous, Ilana anonymous, so I could say, oh, this is what she asked me as it, because I don't remember it. Now, that's, Baruch Hashem, I'm able to figure out some sort of a, of a, of a way to be able to, but if a person keeps himself anonymous and is going through the Rabbanit, there's, five, ten other factors that have come in. What was she feeling when she did it? What did she do that day? Or did she take some sort of a medication? Did she, there's so many other, I, I, I asked, I remember a couple of ladies, I asked, I said, what, she had any salad today? Salad, yeah, I had some salad. Did she have beets? Yeah, she had beets. She had beets in the salad. It it reflects on, on, on you know, the outcome of, of what comes in. These are smallest factors when you're going through a broken through a broken chain of a rabbanit or this and that, and even sometimes I, I think we're, I, I, I've had the opportunity to speak to Rabbi Pinto also in the past, and I, you know, I oftentimes if a rabbi calls me about someone in his community, I say, listen, if it's a real basic thing, I don't mind answering to the rabbi, but typically I would say, have the guy call me, because broken telephone is is very it's you lose. Very important information. So that's off script, not something I want to talk about, but if, if this information is a perception that for some reason people look at it like the rabbi, he's a sacred individual, we have to keep sniot with him, with everything else we could do whatever we'd like, right? But really it's counterproductive in their life. There's no reason to be, like this is what they do. They, they check these kind of clothes. So it's, it's morbid sniot if it comes from from the, from the source. From the source. They know what it is. We deal with what it is. You don't have to, the wives don't got to be, the rabbinites don't have to be involved. The, the rabbis are sitting, I remember, until I was able to, to paskin, and they said, to, to, be, to, to be a posek, I think I've seen around fifteen to 20,000 cloths when I was in Israel. It's, it's a lot. You have to go through again and again and again. These rabbinites, it's... It, not everyone has that. I'm not saying I'm. I'm, I'm not. I'm, tell me, but tell me why I'm wrong. But am I wrong? You tell me. I I I could buy. I could buy that there's that there's a. Avan nitzodek avan. The pamim the pamim adora the abor adora adora kachadash. If you saw 15,000 I'm telling you, I'm mm-hmm. telling you a fact. I, this is, <coughs> and I think from a professional, look at, look at make believe I was here with a white coat. Right? And I, and I went to, I went to uh, Harvard Medical School for 15 years. Right? You would, you would feel uncomfortable with me? No. No. Why? Because I'm a chaptai. What? The clothes you wear are the ones that only you. Oh, okay, but <laughs> yeah, but but I, I, I think it's deep. I think it's it's deeper than that because we respect that this person has you some came sort of. As a doctor, you came, came, yeah. So the perception that people have is that a rabbi is like a holy guy. He is a rabbi. Some rabbis are very holy and very special. But this is what they do. This is what they they, they spend years years of their lives. Doing this, one of my rabbis that I learned with, for 45 years he's doing this already. Till today, he's already, he's, he's deep in his 70s. He, for 45 years he's doing this, day in, day out. He sits for around three or four hours a day for the last, the, the, his, for his whole thing, he's sitting and, and passing the chest. Rabbi Zikahana. But Rabbi Shashol Klein is doing the same thing. Rabbi Shashol Klein is a Tom for Ravosna. Ravosna was doing the same thing for 60 years. This is what they do. All these senior rabbis, Reb Shlomo Miller from down south, Reb Chacham Ovadia, this is what they were doing. They were sitting and learning, and then they had a window of time that they would sit with people. And people would come to the window. In, in Israel, they have windows that they come to. This, this is common practice. Over here, for some reason, we have that, that thing. It was great meeting you guys. Thank you so much. I apologize again that I was late. I'm sorry about no, this is this is the best way. This is, uh, but I, I just 
the beauty is, is I don't have an argument. <laughs> the beauty is when the older ones could, could agree to a younger one, that's something beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hashem, we'll have uh, Rabbi uh, Rosenbaum back for again in a couple of weeks. And uh, next week, Bezrat Hashem, we have uh, Rabbi Pinto also speaking to the men on a different topic. And uh, again, thank you. Yes, in two weeks, Rabbi Rosenbaum will be here for, for the women. Uh, next week, Bezrat Hashem. We'll have Rabbi Pinto. Thank you very much, Rabbi. I really appreciate yes. it. My greatest pleasure. Nice to meet you. Maishu Rosenbaum. Thank you, Rabbi Kadosh. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Maishu Rosenbaum.